Let's try squeezing a quick interaction of Python in under 10 minutes. Of course, it's not realistic. It's, it's not possible to do it in under 10 minutes, but it's just, again, a quick interaction, especially if you're coming from other languages. I think these might be a little bit more useful than just getting a book. Just you can follow this notebook from top to bottom and we're uh, going over the most important features of the language. So before I move any further, if you think that you need extra help with Python or programming in general, which is very important for any data scientist, you can check our online data science course, which includes a very good introduction to programming. It's an entire month. It's a little bit more intensive with a lot of practice and with real live classes. There is an instructor teaching you live two times per week. And again, we have a very good introduction to programming, just pure programming with Python, so you can understand all the nuances of the language. So let's get started now with a little bit of high level, a theoretical introduction to Python, so we can then move into syntax and a little bit more code. Python is a high level interpreted programming language, so that means we don't, we'll, we, will, we will not be compiling our code into machine code. That also means that our code will be portable. We can write Python, a Python script, and we can execute it in Mac, Linux, Windows, and even other platforms without the need of uh, just rearranging the code or making changes. Python is interpreted, so it also means that it's portable. Another important feature is that Python is a dynamic programming language, so we don't need to define types for variables or function parameters or function definitions or returns. There is a feature called Python annotations, which is new, that will let you add type annotations as a sort of documentation, but it will not still be checking types, so Python will always be dynamic, at least for now. Python is also strongly typed, so that means that even though it's dynamic, if you try to match or combine or create operations between types that don't match, for example, comparing an integer to a string, the, there will be an error, okay? Strongly typed language is less defined, it's a little bit more fuzzy, it's hard to define, but again, that's generally the idea and there is an example in this notebook. Finally, Python is fully open source, okay, and it's free software, so anybody can use it and run it, and there are no commercial restrictions. Most important, the most important companies around the world, uh, Facebook, Google, uh, Spotify, Netflix, they all use Python, so again, it's a pretty popular programming language. Um, there are two main versions of Python. You've probably heard Python 2 or Python 3. Let's keep it simple. Python 3 is the way to go. Do not... I repeat, do not use Python 2. Python 2 will be deprecated in the year 2020. Okay, so we have a couple of months still to go and it will be depre deprecated. Most uh, code will be or was ported already, sorry, to Python 3. So Python 3 is the standard. If you're using notebooks.ai, Python 3 is the default one. So just rest assured that you don't need to worry about that. Python actually has multiple implementations. I am linking here to a blog post we wrote some time ago, and it includes a different a differentiation between multiple implementations and what all these means about just what an implementation is. So very quickly, let's go over the syntax of Python. The first thing is that Python will define blocks with indentation. All right, so instead of creating blocks with curly braces as other programming languages, JavaScript, C, Java, we will be defining them with spaces. Just spaces will indicate that this is a new block of code. So in this case, this return line is part of this function, right? It's nested within the function. And we can clearly see that because it's again indented one level to the right of it. Indentation can be created either with tabs or spaces. We will prefer spaces all the time. And again, uh, four spaces will be the, the, the default. Four spaces will denote one indentation level. If you have more indentation level, you keep just adding spaces. You don't need to hit the space key. You can just hit the tab key. And what it will do is just introduce spaces for you. So again, don't worry, you don't have to hit the space bar. The 
if you have any block actually will again be indented. In this case, we have, for example, an if statement that has like two uh, parts. We're gonna see what an if statement is, how there is a little bit more, more to it, like elif and a few other things. But uh, basically, again, all the blocks are defined with indentation. Let me run this code if you need it. We have a introduction to Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter environment, what this all environment is in another video. So comments, pretty standard. You're gonna create them with a pound symbol and this will denote a comment. Defining variables in Python is very simple. Just a name equals and the value that you wanna give. Again, Python is dynamic, so we don't need to declare them first. We don't need to add a type. You can just set it right in place and it will be assigned. You can reassign them if you need it. We don't usually recommend it. The most common data types in Python, or sorry, the most common data types in general in programming are available in Python. Integers, right? They are just uh, what you can see here. In this case, the number 30. Python is, of course, inferring the correct type. You're doing 30 and it's an integer. Floats, right? Numbers with a decimal part, right? Are also part of the standard Python library. Floats have their nuances, right? So if you're not aware of floating point arithmetic, it's something to get into. Um, but again, they have their nuances. So if you ever need to do some like financial processing or calculations, you will need to import this extern this standard library module. It's part of Python, but you will have to import it. It's not just it's not available right as you're writing or as you're running the code. You have to import something external, the decimal module, and now you're gonna have probably the expected result after this computation. Strings are also available. They are pretty common to work with with Python. And in Python 3, they support Unicode by default. So you can see I have an emoji here. If I have like special characters, again, uh, that is all supported. The type is str. To check the length of a string and any other collection, you will use the len function. We also have multi-line strings, right? They just denote uh, here, you don't need to include a new line character. It's just infer from the text that we are writing. So again, you can write paragraphs with multi-line uh, strings. Sometimes you will see that multi-line strings are used for to comment out code, comment out code. It's not just, I'm not gonna say it's not recommended because I do it. It's not the preferred version. There is usually a command to comment out code, pieces of code. If you have to do it, it's just fine, don't worry. There is also a Boolean type, which is the true false type, very simple, that's it. True and false, capitalized, they are actually part of integers. We also have the elusive non type, which rep is pretty much what in other languages is null, is, sorry, known as null. In this case, it's none, and basically, it signifies that there is no value there. It's just the absence or of, 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 a, of a value or just void. So you can see right there, it's, it's empty. All these types, for example, when I show, I show you the type of a string was str or int or float or bool, they will also work as functions, right? So the type of a string is str. The type of an integer is int or int. But int can also be used as a function and it will transform whatever it's here into a string, into an integer in this case. So in this case, what we get is we originally started with a 28 as a string. This is a string 28 and we're turning it into an integer so we can perform computations here safely and it will just work. Let me show you one once again. So sometimes we use these functions and also types as checkers. So they also work as standalone objects, as you can see right here. Functions in Python are pretty straightforward and intuitive, especially if you know about functions. If you don't know about functions, of course, you will have to uh, get a little bit into Python. Uh, but basically, what we have right here 
is a very simple function and the way to define it is the def keyword is mandatory this is what it's gonna start the definition of a function a name and then parentheses and include the parameters that your function receives in this case the function receives no parameters so this is all empty colon symbol or the colon sign will just give uh, the introduction to the body of the function, whatever your function is doing. Immediately what I'm doing right here is just returning the string hello world. I can invoke the function just by using parentheses. So the function name parentheses, I'm not passing any parameters because this function receives no parameters and I'm storing that result in the variable result. I'm creating a new variable and assigning the value of hello immediately into it. A Python function will always return a value, even if you're not explicitly including a, re a return statement, it will be returning none by default. So in this case, I am setting result to the, re to the result of empty, and empty is not returning anything explicitly, so it looks like void or empty, but actually, implicitly, Python is returning none. So if you don't include a return, pretty much Python is doing return none right here. You can pass arguments to Python functions, just as you might imagine, by separating them with commas, and those parameters are available within your body, as you can see right here. There are also a variable number of arguments, in this case with a star, this indicates that these arguments right, will be all passed to the function. In this case, I am working with, with three arguments, with one argument, two n arguments. You can pass as many as you want, and they will all be contained in a tuple inside the function. We're gonna see what a tuple is in a second. There is a little bit more to add to Python functions and arguments and scopes, and it's probably the subject of another video. Um, if you want to get into more advanced definitions of Python functions, check out our course. So operators, um, all the regular arithmetic operate, operators, mathematical operators are available in Python. So just all what you would be expecting. And the order and precedence of them is the, the intuitive one that you would expect. Still, you can check the documentation for more details. Boolean operators are also available, greater than, greater, and equals than, and of course they are returning a Boolean value as we saw. As I told you before, Python is a strongly typed programming language, so for example, checking if 8 is greater than ABC will raise an error, because there is no way of comparing an integer to a string, apples to oranges. All the regular uh, binary operators, just like AND, OR, or even the unary NOT, are also available, right? And you, we will be using them throughout the course. Control flow, you have the usual suspects, if, else, elif. I'm going to tell you what elif is in a second, for loops, while loops, etc. In this case, um, if and else works as any other programming language with the addition of elif, which is kind of a, a nested condition you can keep adding and stacking up all your conditions. So in this case, we have a days subscribed variable and we check if the days subscribed is greater or equals than 30, we are gonna invoke this line. Else if we have like a second condition, if the day subscribed is greater than or equals to 15, we're going to invoke this line, else if, right, in other case, if it's greater than or equals to, two, to 1, sorry, we're going to invoke this line, else at the beginning, this kind of the catch, catch them all, it's going to catch any, the rest of any other condition, it's going to just execute this line. So right here, we get into in this branch, halfway there, because it's not greater than 30, but it is greater than 15. If I change this thing to 30, for example, and I run this line, we are getting into this branch right here. The first one is the one executed. If I this set this thing to zero, 
we get into this branch because it's not greater than 30, not greater than 15, not greater than one, it gets into this branch. For loops, we have an, in a couple of minutes, we're gonna get into for loops with more details, but there is a very important thing here. For loops are not what you are used to from other programming languages. So if you're coming from JavaScript, Java, C, C++, etc., for loops work differently in Python. They are similar to for each in, in other languages, like for example, JavaScript. So just a quick summary, for loops in Python are designed to iterate over collection, not so much as for i equals zero, i plus plus, etc. They are designed to iterate over collections. We're going to see them in, in a sec. While loops are the standard, they work as expected. It's just a while. The condition, and as long as this condition is true, we will be executing this block. We're gonna see now the most important collections and it's gonna be related to the for loop. There are, these are probably the four more important connections in Python, lists, tuples, dictionaries, and sets. Out of these collections, lists and dictionaries are the most popular ones, you will see them all the time. Also tuples and less frequency, frequently, sorry, you will see sets. So lists, what is a list? First of all, sorry, there is one important characteristic of every Python collection, and it's that all the, these collections are heterogeneous. You can store any sort of value within it, and Python will not restrict you to just one type. So as you can see here, I am storing an integer, a string, a boolean, and these will work just as expected. This doesn't mean that you should or you have to store multiple types. Usually this is confusing and we try to keep all the elements within a list, they are all part of the same class or the same object. A list of users, a list of purchases, a list, at least, sorry, a list of IDs, a list of names. So these uh, elements will all be of the same type and they will mean conceptually the same thing. Doesn't, uh, again, it will not break if you mix types we usually we don't want to mix type just to make more sense in our programs. Once you have constructed a list, you can access individual elements, in this case L0 or L1, by keys, right? By indices, sorry, by the sequential position, because a list is a mutable order sequence. It's a sequence of elements in which the order you have given to them in matters, and the list will preserve that order. So if I show you the list right here, again, the order is preserved. It's like a list has a an, an, uh, hidden index. So this is going to be element zero, this is going to be element one, and this is going to be element two. So you can access those elements directly with these indices, square brackets, and the index works. You can also access them in reverse position, minus one, minus two, minus three. And in that case, you can see here that it also works. Lists, again, are mutable and they are ordered. So for example, all the operations that will add things to a list will also have a component of order. I'm gonna add this thing and I wanna add it at the end. So I'll be appending it. And now my list will have this string at the end. I can check if an element is part of a list with the in operator. Python in L, Ruby in L is of course false because I don't have a Ruby in here. A tuple is an immutable sequence of elements. It's a collection and it's very similar to a list, but there is a big difference. And again, it's that it's immutable. Once a tuple is created, it cannot be changed anymore. It can't be modified. So this is my tuple right there, heterogeneous again, it will not be changed anymore. Accessing elements of tuples and checking membership works in the same way as a list. So again, a tuple you created once and then it's fixed, it can't be changed anymore. Dictionaries are also very important data structures. These change completely the type. It's no longer a sequence as we were saying with tuples and lists. Dictionaries are an unordered collection of key values. All right, sometimes called maps 
in other programming languages. It's a key that access a value. We're storing values this is the main data we want to store. But again, we are giving it a label, right? So we're storing this value under the name label. These labels have a restriction, they have to be immutable, we usually employ less, uh, sorry, strings for these labels. So you can see this is a dictionary. So to access any value in the dictionary, you will be using the square brackets, but instead of the index, the positional index, there is no position, these are unordered, this is not the first and this, one, this is the second, these are unordered. The way to access values is by their key. So I want to get the value under email. I do user at email. Checking membership works by key. So I can check if age is defined if in this dictionary. I can also check if last name is defined, which is false, because again, there is no last name in here. And finally, sets. Sets are an interesting data structure, less used, to be honest, but pretty interesting. The, the big characteristic of sets is that they are unordered collections that hold only unique elements. They will drop duplicates. So in this case, I'm creating this set, which has 31379131. 3, 1, 3, 7, 9, 1, 3, 1. 3 and 1, they are repeated. Once I create the set, Again, it has dropped all the duplicate elements. It has also changed the order. So that's important. Remember that these are unordered. I set initially three one, and here it's just doing one three. It did whatever it wanted to do. And this can change in platforms, different platforms. It's just unordered. You can never rely on the order of either dictionaries or sets. This is very important. And again, it has dropped all the duplicates. Adding a new element to a set is very simple. I can just do dot add 10. We can check the set again. 10 is right there. Note that there is no positional parameter or component here of where to add to the set. There is no append or insert at the beginning. It's just add because again, it's an order. So the element will be placed pretty much wherever Python wants to place it. You can also remove from sets with the pop method. It popped the first one that it got, number one in this case. You can iterate collections again with the for loop, and these collections can be pretty much anything a dictionary, a set, a list, a tuple, or even a string. They can all be uh, iterated with a for loop. So, again, remember, for loops in Python are completely different beasts from what you might be used in other programming languages, like, for example, Java. JavaScript, C, C++, etc. For loops in Python are more are similar to for each in other programming languages. Finally, modules, you can import modules that are just bundles of functionality, right? You can import them with the import key or as we saw before with the from module import something we saw a couple of lines ago with decimal and you can access these modules. There, Python has a pretty interesting and rich standard library of pretty much things that are already installed. That's what standard library means. When you install Python, you have a bunch of like batteries included. You have a bunch of modules that are already installed. But if you think that one's missing, you need some functionality that is not provided by the standard library, you can always install third-party modules or modules or packages that are created by other developers. It's fairly easy to do it. Finally, exceptions, a quick note on exceptions. We saw that we were, for example, when we were comparing strings to numbers, we were going to have an, uh, an error. Actually, this error is in the form of an exception. Python is raising an exception that we can catch. The try catch block of Python is actually called try accept, right? So in this case, if something happens, we're gonna catch it with these and, and, and respond with this line. The accept block can accept what's the actual error that we're expecting. It's usually recommended to use this block, right? So this is again just to indicate what's the error that we're expecting. In other case, this is what we call a Pokemon exception. Catch them all. Any error that happens in this block will be catched by this given 
um, line or actually this except block. So again, this is a very quick introduction to the Python programming language, especially if you have some experience with it with other languages or if you needed like a refresher. We will be doing a lot of coding throughout these course and if you need a like you need more details or learn more depth the the Python programming language or programming in general, you can check our uh, our, our more uh, intensive bootcamp for data science.